All right, friends, thank you for joining us on the Suzy Customer Summit keynote. So this discussion is designed to give you a look into how one of the largest companies in the world innovated their insights programs in 2020, how they adopted agile processes over the years, and how they're moving forward in an uncertain world. I'm Katie Gross, I'm the Chief Customer Officer here at Suzy, and I'm joined on the virtual stage by one of our close partners, Nick Graham, VP of Insights at PepsiCo. He also happens to be a fellow English countryman, so get ready. It's going to be a cacophony of British accents and agile insights. <laughs> so, Nick, I'd love you to introduce yourself and a little bit more about your role at Pepsi over to the audience. Fantastic. Thank you, Katie. Yes, <clears throat> we'll try and keep up the Britishness. I'll have some tea later just to live mm -hmm. up to our stereotypes. Um, so, Nick Graham, I'm the head of consumer insights and analytics for PepsiCo's North American beverages uh, team. Um, so, I have a team of about 75 across the US and Canada supporting our entire portfolio of beverage brands from Pepsi to our sparkling water brand, Bubbly, which I'm drinking here, um, as well as our five divisional business units. Um, and basically, the team does really supports the business agenda from soup to nuts, from building consumer centricity, a lot of the stuff that Avi has talked about, like that consumer closeness and deep consumer understanding, um, developing brand and category strategy through to supporting, you know, development and execution of new advertising, programming, innovation, the whole gamut. So uh, Susie has been an incredible partner um, for us as we continue our agile journey across that entire spectrum. Awesome. Thanks for that. So we're going to start with kind of the history of agility at Pepsi. So Nick, I'd love you to take us back to when you first started at Pepsi eight years ago. What were the research processes you had at that time? And when did PepsiCo start testing agile tools? Yeah, I mean, I'd say that um, even before I joined, um, PepsiCo has really been, or likes to think of itself, I think, as a pioneer of research methodologies. Um, I, it was interesting, when I first joined PepsiCo, um, people use this phrase about sort of this healthy sense of dissatisfaction in the business. I think it partly comes from us, you know, being very much a challenger brand mentality. So um, anyone who's ever worked with Pepsi knows that Pepsi people um, tend to be not very satisfied with the status quo. They're always thinking about, you know, what they can do better, faster, leaner. So I think there's sort of an inherent DNA element to this. Um, but I think the the push for faster, more agile testing was really evident when I joined eight years ago, which was, um, you know, increasingly we just needed to be faster and more agile as a company. You know, you have the ever-changing cultural landscape, the media landscape, you have a much more fragmented and fast-paced media landscape. And then the innovation cycle itself was becoming much faster and more fragmented. You know, think omni-channel, the development of e-com, um, direct to consumer, and um, yeah, you know, we were facing very different competitors who didn't have the typical one to two year innovation development cycle that big CPGs had. Mm -hmm. So, well, I think we were like like lots of CPG companies. You know, we were really comfortable with the 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 tools we had in some respect. I think the reality was that the turnaround time was just becoming unsustainable. Um, and as you and I've talked about before, right? You know, as good as the work is. If the work comes back after the decision has been made, then the work is just nice to know, right? And no, nobody in Insights um, wants to be doing nice to know work. Um, so I think that was one big part of it, was just the, the speed at which the business operated meant we needed to catch up to make sure that we were still helping to drive and shape the agenda. And then I think the other big piece was um, really that a lot of, I think, the standard tools that we were using, the sort of traditional gold standard tools felt very one size fits all. Um, I don't, don't necessarily think they were intended to be that, but they were in some ways built for a world of above the line TV advertising, um, big, large format launches. And again, sort of in the fragmented world, you know, we had much more, a much greater proliferation of advertising, programming, innovation. You know, what if something's going to launch in DTC first? Um, what if it's going to launch in um, digital first? And so we, we needed a much more sort of complete suite of tools to be able to answer all of those different types of, um, of uh, solutions that we had. And so, um, you know, I think we were, when we really started this pilot, um, more agile solutions, it was especially it was in, in advertising and innovation testing. That was where the biggest need was in terms of the turnaround time. But I think one of the interesting things, and actually how we first got introduced to Susie, 
was I think the we then quickly realized the power of some of the quick turn survey work that I know we've done with you over the last couple of years to really help fill in all of those ad hoc questions. So if any, as I'm sure lots of people on this call, right, work in, in, uh, in client businesses, uh, insights leaders get asked a thousand questions a day and sometimes you have the answer, many times you don't. And in the past, it was just, you know, time and cost prohibitive to answer all of those things. And so the ability to bring consumer centricity to the business was harder. Um, but I think now we can do so much more of that through platforms like Suzy. Um, and we'll, you know, we can talk a little bit more about some of the trials and tribulations we found, but I think it was really a beginning to do, we started with a lot of ad hoc piloting. And then starting four or five years ago, we really started to organize at a global level and build out, um, really build out our partnerships and capabilities um, through uh, a more sort of systematic kind of global um, um, set of tools. Yeah, that's great. Over the years, has, was there kind of a tipping point that took you in, even further in depth with Agile tools? Yeah, it's interesting. I don't think there's one tipping point per se. I think it's more like there's a series of tipping points along the way. I think one thing is funny is once you start to pilot these tools is they just take on their own momentum. So um, once the business knows they can get the answer much quicker, then suddenly, you know, A, inside the associates know they can influence the agenda more effectively, but also just the business expects that almost every question can be answered more quickly. And so I think it creates its own it creates its own momentum, it creates its own speed, if you like. Um, but there's no doubt that the last year and a half, although it feels like 100 years now, right? But the last year and a half has had a huge acceleration effect. It's just, I mean, I don't need to tell this team this, but it's just the sheer pace of change. Um, obviously COVID, but then Black Lives Matter and the social justice movement has really meant the need for quicker research. The business has so many questions and it needs to act quickly. Um, and particularly that's true on the ad hoc side as well. Um, so I think it's it's a confluence of events and it's just, I think, accelerated more and more um, over time. And I think then the other factor that's been driving it is, particularly from my team has been, well, if we can automate and speed up this bit of the work that we're doing, does that free us up actually to do, to spend more time on the things that do take time, that do take, um more sort of mental energy and mental effort and where we do actually need to spend the time thinking about things yeah for sure um and and that's obviously we've, we've seen so much of it over the past year where everybody needed to start running at the speed of, uh, of consumer change which was happening twice a day let alone kind of every month um was budget a factor at any point in the adoption of agility was that kind of like decreasing budgets a thing or was it really about the speed that you just mentioned I mean, so I know for some corporate partner, um, uh, corporate peers of mine, um, definitely better use of budgets or sort of managing a reduction in insights budget was definitely a component. I would say that certainly for PepsiCo, our investment in insights continues to be really strong. And it was not necessarily the primary motivating factor. I think it was much more focused on speed, agility, more customized solutions um, and being able to therefore influence the agenda, the business agenda more effectively. Having said that, while I mean, cost saving wasn't necessarily the aim, I think what it has, as we've been through this process, what we've realized is the money that it has freed up. So the time and money that we're not now spending on say uh, concept testing or advertising testing, that has actually suddenly like, oh, I actually now have this bonus money. I wasn't necessarily, hadn't necessarily planned on in the past that I can spend on some of those um, bigger projects that are important, but not necessarily always urgent. So some of that sort of important, not urgent stuff that always gets put off, um, we can spend, uh, invest our time and energy and money um, more in those projects. Yeah, that's great. So it's helped you get faster, but also do more with the budgets that, that you do have. There was actually a, a tactical question um, exactly. from the audience there um, that says, is everything at Pepsi driven by speedy responses or is there still merit to staggering out or stage rollouts of a singular question across demographics, regions, timing, I guess, weekday to weekends and so on? Is that still a factor? Um, so I, do, I think one of the lessons we've had from this is not everything can and not everything should require a speedy response. And, and I do think 
I know we're going to go and talk about some of the lessons learned. Mm -hmm. I do think there was a moment in time during this journey when everyone wanted everything just faster. And as a result of that, this, you just sometimes, you know, if you're trying to reach a really hard to reach audience or a really specific target, yeah. sometimes that just takes time, right? You need to reach those people. You need to get the number and the quality of responses. And sometimes, you know, one of the things I actually love about the retargeting work um, tool that you have is that sometimes you, it's not obvious, maybe that first piece of work that you do, what, why something is happening or why you're getting the response. Yeah. So the ability to go back and iterate, I think is really important. Um, so I think speed is undoubtedly a driving factor, but what's been, I think, really important through this is even if something takes two weeks, three weeks, it's still something that maybe five years ago would have taken six, eight, 10, 12 weeks. So even if it's taking time, it's just taking, it's just more concentrated in terms of the, the time frame. But absolutely, I think we want to be careful that we're not compromising the quality of the work that we're doing. And if it takes time, it takes time. And there's going to be work that's going to take weeks, maybe months to do. And that should take weeks or months to do, not days. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good point about the, the niche or harder to reach audiences or certain quota groups. It's certainly about you know, taking the time to, to find all of those respondents. Um, it is interesting. I remember my, my first uh, role in market research was in the panel industry, and we would say minimum three days in field. And now, here at Susie, we're about minimum ten minutes in field. Is the uh, is the time frame we're looking <laughs> at? So, talking about kind of the adoption of agile tools as you were adopting them, kind of over the years, mm. was there a big learning curve for you and the team? You touched upon it a little bit. But I'd love to know a little bit more detail about what that learning curve looked like and what that progression has been for Pepsi. Yes, I mean, absolutely. I think and I think anybody who has been kind of part of the agile research world over the last five to 10 years, right, has, has we've all been through a learning curve of what is possible and feasible and uh, preferable, right, I guess, as we think about agile research. I think certainly at the beginning, I think we definitely experienced issues and it wasn't just PepsiCo, it wasn't just corporates. I think also a lot of the vendors we were working with at the time, just about over-promising, under-delivering. Um, I think there were lots of cases where, you know, um, vendors would come to us and says, we can do this so much faster. But what they were really bringing, they were bringing an agile platform where they're bringing a great tech solution, but not necessarily understanding the complexity of research or particularly, you know, for some of the, the brands or the issues they're working on, the level of customization that might be required. So if you have a problem that is you know, let's go back to some of the stuff that Arvi talked about when he was talking about the standard solution. You have a really standard sort of like question and maybe a pretty broad sample. And, you know, you were okay with with kind of trading off some of the um, questions or some of the granularity that you might want. Then that's, then some of them worked um, fine from that perspective. But I think very quickly we realized we needed a bit more customization. We needed to actually go deeper on some subgroups and and it was it very quickly sort of ran into the the mud a little bit on some of those um, early stage agile tools. Um, and I remember, you know, not Susie, I will say, but you know, there was sometimes that, you know, we ended up with pretty poor recruitment um, because the speed was sort of overwhelming everything else and the desire to just get the study completed in some sort of like record breaking time overtook the getting goods and quality recruitment. And, and then sometimes I can think again, we sort of ended up with substandard solutions or sort of accepting those, or we sort of ended up giving up on things that we really needed in terms of customization. And that just kind of screwed us up a bit on the back end of the research because we couldn't really explain what we were seeing. And so the speed was sort of traded off by the fact that we didn't really have the answers that we needed. Um, I will say, I think on top of that, one of the things I don't think we were prepared for as a team was, the sort of pros and cons of DIY. Um, mm -hmm. So again, I remember when I first started on this journey, DIY was the big selling point, right? Like it's fantastic, your team can do this, you don't have to wait on a vendor, you can press this button and off it goes and, and the sample is recruited and the survey is completed. I think that sounds really seductive until we realized, you know, how much work that can actually involve with the internal team. And I think particularly, it's not just the sort of bandwidth of, oh, I've got to go and create a report now. 
it's just sometimes you need a research expert to sit alongside you and say either oh actually you need to configure this differently if that's actually what you're looking to do or um when you're analyzing sometimes you just need someone maybe who knows the tool who knows the um um the setup who can actually kind of work through well i think the reason you're getting this this data and if we should we cut it differently and i think that's sort of it's not always necessarily all the way to white glove, but sometimes you just need some support and guidance to help you. And I think what we found through the journey is there were some definitely some periods when you know, I got very honest feedback from my team of feeling a little bit sort of out in the cold. Like suddenly we've gone from this world of completely white glove research to oh, it felt like it was just over to them. And that and if well, I don't think we were always fully prepared and fully um sort of set up to help manage the teams through that journey it is it is fundamentally a change management program you're going yeah. through it isn't just like oh we're going to switch vendors and we're going to change around the tools you have to think about it much more consciously than just uh, like tool swap out um i will say that i think over the last five years you know we've made huge progress as an industry um in sort of fixing some of the initial, initial sort of teething problems i think we had in the agile space um, and I think certainly PepsiCo, and I'll certainly speak for some of my corporate peers as well, I'm much more confident now in piloting um, more agile solutions and switching wholesale to more agile solutions. I think, as you sort of alluded to before, there's still some challenges that we face in a few spaces. I think um, hard to recruit groups, um, particularly those who maybe are not, um, don't have a big um, online presence. So unacculturated Hispanics, um, lower income, people potentially in rural areas of the states. Um, again, none of these are insurmountable, but again, it's we've seen it's not as straightforward as we would like to believe. Um, although I cover the US, it's been a big issue for some of the international markets, you know, who still rely historically on a lot of um, face to face research. And so again, online research has its um, its downsides or some challenges from that perspective. And then, as I said, I think finding just, we're still finding that right balance between the DIY and the consultancy, the automated and the customized. And it's, it's the eternal battle of sort of trading off exactly what you want from the speed that you want it to be delivered in. And just what's your, um, what's the balance that you're willing to accept between those. Um, and so I think, yeah, I mean, to me, that's the big the big piece is just knowing how to get that balance right and knowing and having confidence to know what you can migrate and what you're not willing to migrate, at least not now, and just willing to sort of sequence it over time as opposed to just thinking you can do it all in one go. Yeah, yeah, that makes um, a lot of sense. I think you guys were really early to um, to, to embrace Agile tools. I um, have a lot of friends in the industry who work at um, multiple Agile tools and DIY platforms who all said they were kind of being snuck in the back door sometimes for large corporates um, because they were perceived mm. potentially as, as quick and dirty back in those earlier days. Um, but whereas I think we've all come a long way to, to put a lot of rigor into the tools. Um, and certainly um, at yeah. Suzy, I won't steal uh, Nick, uh, our, our Nick G um, and Will's thunder, but building customization into templates and building custom templates is something we've really focused on as well just to make sure that we're we're not just providing our clients with a cookie cutter approach so you'll find out more about that at, at 3 p.m everybody and of course customization of the the audiences as you mentioned as well um thinking about uh the the kind of the users themselves so what i was really impressed with when um when we were first working with pepsico is the user adoption was really really strong and i've seen that struggle at other companies um where it may have been a kind of decision made by a leadership team to become faster and, and potentially save on budget but they didn't necessarily arm the teams with the right um that kind of change management that you just mentioned i'd love to know a little bit more about how you kind of encouraged your team and, and how you led your team through this change management process I think a lot of it is how do you how do you position this to the team and how do you frame this up to the team in a way that actually feels like it's empowering and enabling them as opposed to feeling like um either productivity exercise or feeling like um oh this is one more thing i'm going to add to your plate mm -hmm. because unsurprisingly i think when i'm not necessarily at pepsico but i think in in some other teams i've seen it does feel like the team, the insights teams are being sort of strong armed into using these tools. And like, you will now, you know, you will now move to this new, this new approach and this new standard. And I think 
I mean, it's just human nature, right? Like it's the whole process of change. But but what's in it for me? Like what am what am I as an associate getting out of this? I would say, I think going back to what I talked about with um, PepsiCo people generally, I think that sort of sense of dissatisfaction and that desire sometimes to want to go faster and want to do things differently. I think that it may be a good um, sort of culture in which um, to land um, tools like Suzy and other agile solutions, because I think people initially immediately understood that this could actually be quite empowering to them. So, you know, I remember when I first joined and people were frustrated that a piece of advertising testing that the, that they were doing, it just disappeared into the ether for four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're like, my business partner keeps saying, where's the results of this? And I, and I have literally no control over what's happening. Um, and so I think not just the speed, but the level of control that I think that gave um, the insights teams in PepsiCo, I think it was actually a really empowering thing from the very beginning. Again, I think you just have to get the balance right of empowering, giving them control, giving them the ability to move things quickly and be responsive, but finding the right balance so they don't feel completely isolated and sort of stuck doing everything themselves. Um, and so it does really require sort of that that change management process. I think one thing that really helped us is doing sort of undertaking some controlled pilots and test and learns from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So not trying to do it all from day one, even though sometimes there's a desire, right, to kind of let's just go and let's do it all right now. But to do these test and learns to understand not just how the tool works, because I think that's a relatively simple thing to learn. It's actually the big question is how are people going to use it? How are they going to experience it? How's this going to work in real life? Do you need support with something like this or can you run it yourself? And I think that's the bit that we try to focus on, particularly as we're building out some of our internal platforms and building out our suite of tools um, in collaboration with partners was understanding the experience of using it and how much support was needed and kind of providing that training um, and handheld support as people went through it. I think that's that actually taught us a lot about how to roll them out, not just is the tool good enough and oh, is it going to give us what we need with a certain budget and a certain time frame. And I will say the other thing is that having a few partners, like trusted partners that you can really work with is key. Again, I think we we went through this period of shiny object syndrome and every new vendor was the next big thing and we and we ended up it almost just became overwhelming for the teams because it was like oh we're trying this vendor for this and we're trying this vendor for this and we're going to use this vendor for this. and it's just it's a lot to try and mentally manage so what we found is actually you know working obviously with partners like yourselves and, and then one or two others is actually starting to create a platform of suite a suite of solutions with a couple of key mm -hmm. partners has actually been really helpful because at the end of the day, a lot of this is about the sort of trusted relationship that you're building. And again, people don't want to do research in a in a bubble or in an ivory tower. They actually want someone they can come and talk to, um, a face that they can speak to and that they can brainstorm with. And so I think building that sense of partnership um, and connection and that relationship, I think, is a really important part. I mean, people ultimately want a research partner. They don't just want a technology yeah. deliverer or technology platform. Yeah, absolutely. And certainly at Susie, we've been lucky to, Will, that you'll all meet at 3 p.m. Um, came from a client side, um, which was wonderful to really have someone who had used the Susie platform for so long to to join us, along with a number of other um, very well-established methodologists and market researchers. Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned that kind of overlapping technology and what's the next shiny thing, just keeping all the passwords together, let alone the um, which tool is the best, best to be utilized in each project. Speaking of um, DIY tools, when do you use kind of a DIY solution and when do you still rely on that kind of traditional managed services process with a, a more traditional market research agency? I'd love to see kind of what that tension is and what that balance is for you guys. Yeah, I think it's, I would say, I don't, I don't know if we have exactly the answer yet because it, I think as you go through the cycles um, of the planning process and you know, no cycle is ever like the last one, right? So, and, and as we now know from 2020, no year is ever quite like the last year or quite like you, how you imagined it was gonna be. And so, it's not like last year. I think what we've found is, um, right, let's, let's hope so. Um, we've tended to use the sort of more DIY platforms either for kind of, um, 
kind of fairly simple ad hoc questions, right? So if there's a particular set of questions we need about, like for example, um, coming up to Super Bowl, um, we were furnishing the team with some context around how consumers are, um, how consumers were likely to be celebrating Super Bowl, who they were going to be with, what they were looking forward to, to in terms of advertising. So some of the sort of more discrete ad hoc questions um, where you don't necessarily need lots of complex subgroups, you've mainly been only got one or two groups, um, are obviously pretty simple for the for, um, for the teams to field. And then some of the more sort of standardized, repeatable studies. So particularly, um, we focused a lot on con innovation concept testing and advertising testing, and particularly TV advertising, because digital does get a bit more complicated depending on the platform you're looking at. So again, if it's relatively simple in terms of an innovation concept test, mainly an advertising, TV advertising um, testing. We've found that that's actually something that is pretty automatable, pretty standardized um, for most cases. I think where we've used managed services is even with those examples, there are times when the innovation you're testing is a little uh, different, right? Maybe it's a really niche idea or it's going through a unique channel. And so maybe it's going through e-com or one of our food service channels. And so you need to set up the study differently or you need to get a different, um, you know, you need a really different sample. And then equally with advertising testing, again, once you get to, um, you know, sometimes we have advertising that's quite different because maybe it's representing an entire portfolio versus a single brand or maybe it's a sub brand. So sometimes you just need some help configuring the testing differently. Um, and then again, digital and social is obviously completely different because you really do need to look at it in context. And so sort of the sometimes the standardized solutions need some more um, uh, more detailed sort of thoughts, more detailed thought needs to go into how you're gonna set them up and, and run them. And then particularly, I think for anything kind of more complex research, where particularly some, some of the team may not be familiar setting them up and running them and interpreting and analyzing them, picking things like you know, discrete choice modeling, for example, where you, you actually do need real expertise to help you, you know, be a build and field that research, field that research, but also to model the results as well. That's not, it's not necessarily something that people know how to do or know how to do with confidence. And so I think any of those sort of more complicated um, uh, studies, we, we continue to, we continue to use managed services for. Um, and then again, I think, really think about what does this, my mantra has been, let's automate, um, standardize and sort of compress whatever we can, but then we don't have to do that to everything. Then that should allow us time and space and money to focus on, you know, if a discrete choice modeling piece of work takes longer, then that's okay. Cause maybe that's, that's what we're freeing up our time to do. Or if we need to go and do an in-depth piece of segmentation work and we want it to take time because we need really to really iterate on something or build on something over time i think that's fine i think i'm so i don't think everything can and should be compressed but the things that we can and should compress and automate we definitely should do because then that will free up the time for everything else yeah yeah i think it also accelerates careers in market research too my first um role at a market research agency was really formatting data tables and charts and putting them into the correct fonts and the colors and, and getting them ready. Um, and really that, you know, if that was able to be automated at that time, I would have been able to get a bit more creative with my career and, and probably moved a little, uh, little bit quicker and so on. Um, a, right. a comment from the audience, Gita mentioned, uh, I think agreed on, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that um, particularly for some of the junior team now, I'm hoping that the benefits of this more agile um, uh, process and agile approach to insights and particularly the more automation of reporting, et cetera, in time will actually free them up to do, as you say, very different things than maybe what you and I did when we first started out. So hopefully it will be actually, again, a liberating and empowering opportunity for them as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Gita on the um, the, the chat mentioned um, she agrees on DIY and and managed services and having support teams. It's really about you know having someone to share and talk that information through while analyzing the data and just be able to bounce ideas off. Um, so she can't do it all on her own. Um, even though she has a research background and, and training on platforms, it's really about having a collaborative partner to, to share that information with. So thanks, Gita, for the uh, comment there. Um, 
so thinking forward, um, let's hack it our magic ball, magic wands out um, and uh, crystal ball. So what do you think the next steps are to keep your team agile in 2021 um, in particular? But then what do you think is going to happen over the next kind of two to three years in our industry? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we'll sort of um, building up of what we were just talking about uh, a few minutes ago, I think the pressure to from all sides to continue to um, automate, standardize, um, compress the timelines for research that that's appropriate for. I think that's going to continue because I think we've now all recognized that there's a huge opportunity here. There's a huge opportunity for the industry and there's a huge opportunity for in insights leaders and insights professionals that, you know, back, back to where we started, that it's going to empower them and give them so much more influence over the business agenda because they can quickly answer business questions. They can they can answer business questions before the business has even asked them because they can use a, tools like this to kind of time and cost effectively sort of dig into questions that they're interested in. So I do think that that whole push to continue to accelerate and continue to compress will come. I do think you know there's some there's some limits to that. There's some things that we just can't necessarily compress because they are going to take time. And particularly, I think, on the analysis side, the reporting, I think, is one thing. You know, a lot of that, as we were talking yeah. about, could be automated. But the analysis part, I think, still takes, even with AI overlays, I think it still takes, as Gita was saying, it's, it's discussion, mm -hmm. it takes debate. You need to go, well, how about if I look at it and cut it a different way? So I think some of that won't change. I don't want that to change. I actually think, I think that human human plus AI integration and that analysis, I think is so critically important um, to bring the depth of understanding and analysis. Um, but again, I think you'll see that push for automation, standardization and agile solutions across a whole host of things that you know, Avi was talking about, whether it's in market measurement and tracking, segmentation, discrete choice, line optimization, all the things that still take time and feel very heavy to manage um, right now or, and are, are you know, expensive. I think you'll see a lot of that continue to become more automated and more agile. Um, and then I think from the other two big areas I think we'll see is one is just research becoming a bit more iterative, hopefully, as a result. You know, I, I'm really not a big fan of this, like you've done the research and now you're done, you move on. My biggest, one of my biggest hopes from Agile Research has been that if it only takes this long, can we do this and then learn something and then test again and then test again? And so can we live, can we actually unlock the dream of more iterative research by sort of compressing each phase of it a little bit? So we can do in what would have taken two weeks before, we can actually use those two weeks to do, let's say three cycles of research as opposed to a singular one. And then I think as RV was teeing up at the very end, I think the integration of data obviously is going to become more important between um, platforms like Suzy and, and vendors like Suzy and PepsiCo. So that sort of um, API integration of data across uh, across the vendor client wall. But then I think also particularly integration of data within a platform. So what can we start to learn? What are the meta learnings we can get as we start to see all of the data come together? Not just normative, which I think, you know, okay, obviously that's a, mm -hmm. a, a really important part of this, but what can we through using machine learning and using AI, how can we see bigger patterns in the data? Um, how can we connect data sets together? Um, so, you know, one of the things I know we're, we're looking at with, uh, with some of our internal data, our concept testing data right now is understanding how concepts with certain attributes have tested over time and can you start to see some meta learnings and some some bigger um uh sort of learnings come out of that so i think that's my hope is that from an agility standpoint but again housing all this data um will actually enable us to overlay sort of more integrated and more um uh complex analysis on it yeah Absolutely. Um, and Nick, I was smirking because you're uh, going to be super excited about what we present at three o'clock today, all about kind of connecting the dots, even internally in our own platform and helping you build out those uh, those patterns yeah. and, and solutions yeah. over time, of course, by standardizing it with templates and, and customized templates. And we can really partner with a number of CPG and, and food and beverage companies in the, in the same way. And you're right, the, you know, I'm excited for 
the, the heavy lifts like max diffs and conjoints to be automated um, in the future. We're very busily recruiting data scientists to help us really kind of speed up that time to insight um, on the more complex studies as well. So we've also got a lot of people um, and a lot of senior clients uh, in the room. So final question for you is what advice do you have for other market researchers about ways that they can uh, look at agile within their companies? And, and actually on that point, I think it's, it's really important that we do separate the phrase agile from DIY because agility is not just about fast and do it yourself. It really is about iterative um, uh, approaches. But yeah, I'd love for you to share kind of any insights, guidance you have for anybody um, that's joined us today who maybe be first looking at us for, for a brand new tool. Yeah, I think I would start by saying, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And don't just say speed, because obviously it's speed and agility, because otherwise we wouldn't be having this conversation. But so, mm -hmm. you know, what's your, what's your, what do your, what do your team think? What do they think the problem to solve is? What do your stakeholders think? What do your leadership team think? And, and make sure you understand the answer to all of those, because again, I think it may not be the same answer for everybody. And so trying to understand the frame that everybody could come to, um, Agile research uh, too, I think will be really helpful in you then creating a vision that everyone can get behind and get it, and particularly get excited about. Because as you said about adoption, adoption, yeah. really true adoption and integration, it takes people being excited and inspired by this. And there's only, there's sometimes only so far that just getting it faster will actually take you. That's a huge part of it, but there's lots of other, I mean, we're, we're human market researchers. We understand there is more than one singular emotion that motivates people. So understand what it is that's really gonna motivate your team and excite them. And then as you know, we've talked about through this, find what's the right balance for your team between DIY and white glove and fully managed services and how much is you can you automate versus customize and it might not be the same for every single problem to solve that you have but understanding where you start to draw from the beginning where you want those where you want those lines to be and i think you'll find the process much smoother and then my last point my last suggestion would just be as you're thinking about going on this journey it's do some sort of control test and learns to begin with. And again, not just the tool, but actually get your teams working with it. Get not just one project, get them running multiple projects through it um, and experience the highs and lows of it. What do they not like? Uh, what are the big problems they face? And, and, and make sure that you then have a plan in place with your partner to resolve those when you roll it out more broadly. And I think together that will make the 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 adoption of these tools, which is really the critical piece, the adoption of these tools much yeah. smoother and much more exciting and engaging for the teams. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's much more than just testing a project. Um, it's all about, it's to testing the always on nature of a platform um, like Suzy or other tools um, to make yeah. sure it's the right fit for, for your business. And and you're right, there's plenty of us that offer DIY, assisted DIY full service um, and really building out that partnership um, with our clients. Okay, there's no further questions in the chat from what I can see. Um, so this has been absolutely fantastic. Um, love talking to, well, love talking to a fellow British person, of course, <laughs> at all times. Um, so Nick, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Everybody on the call, please join us for our next session that's gonna feature Nick Goshaw, our Chief Product Officer, and Will Simarosa, our SVP of Market Research. They're going to be exploring a lot about our new features and products that are coming up. Um, and this great conversation really kind of teed us up ready for that conversation. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, Katie.